the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Shalom. Good morning, men. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Caleb, son of Jephthah, the Kenzanite, adopted into the tribe of Judah. My ancestors were Edomites, the descendant of Esau. We lived in this land when Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were here. We were in Canaan at that time. And although I was not a Jew and my ancestors and forefathers were not Jewish, they adopted us into their tribe. We became circumcised men, and when we were in Egypt, we celebrated the Passover. And now here we are again in this promised land, having been part of the scout team with Joshua, ten other spies, we scouted this land. This land with the beautiful foliage, land with fruit and vegetables and flowing rivers and streams that would quench our parched lips from traversing in the wilderness the negative desert. We're here. His promised land. When we took the report back to the people, even though we showed them proof of how great this land was, they failed to believe us. It took two of us to take a cluster of grapes back to show them the abundance that's here, but their unbelief, the fear in their hearts, the doubts in their mind resonated to such a fashion that they said, it's impossible, Caleb. We cannot take that. <coughs> we were grieved in our hearts and we begged them to be careful of the wrath of God because God always deals with unbelief and doubt and rebellion. Does he not? Amen? I mean, does he not? Amen? Amen. So the people doubted. The fear in their hearts was drowned out with even the promises to their ears that the God who was for them could walk with them. We tore our clothes and we begged them. We pleaded with them, please, Listen, we need to go up and take the land. That was over 40 years ago. But to no avail. They did not heed. And as a result, God's judgment came upon his own people. People and a generation that had been in Egypt with Pharaoh who had seen the miraculous signs that opened Pharaoh's eyes to who we were as the Israelites and the people of God. The generation that saw the Red Sea part before them, walked across on dry ground. I was with them. I was part of that generation, that team. We crossed dry ground only to see the Red Sea parted and then poured back on the armies of Pharaoh utterly destroying them. The generation that saw the manna and the quail provided daily for them did not believe that they could inherit this beautiful land. The generation saw water come from a rock. Cloud by day and a pillar of fire by now. Doubting the promises of God. And what we need to do, man, is start strong in our faith with God. We need to stand determined with Him so that we can finish well. An entire generation of people died in the wilderness, died a horrible death without ever seeing the promise and inheriting what God had for them. Even our leadership, Moses and Aaron, were not allowed to come into the promised land because of their disobedience and sin against God. Joshua and myself, mm. we held on to what God had for us. I held on to what God's Word had spoken to me. And God had given me this promise so long ago. He said, My servant Caleb, because of a different spirit that he had, followed me fully, I will bring him into the land which flows with milk and honey. 
His descendants will inherit. I'm here today. Forty years wandering in the wilderness, several years taking care of Jericho and Ai. We move with the other tribes, pushing back the strongholds in this promised land. I'm one of the old guys, and we've got a whole new generation that's come with us to claim this land for Almighty God. But I reminded my leader, Joshua. I said, Joshua, I was told that wherever my feet would tread, wherever my feet would walk, I could claim that for my land. And I was promised, as part of the tribe of Judah, Mount Hebron. You see it in the distance. The beauty, the highest part of all the promised land. I wanted that for my future generations. My future descendants were going to inherit that land. The land where Abraham offered up Isaac. The land where Abraham and Sarah are still buried to this day. The land that where from there you can look out over the vast promised land. This land of Canaan. See God's delight. That's why I, King, wanted that. So today I simply say to Joshua, give me that mountain. Give me that mountain for an inheritance to the Lord. My people will defeat the Amalekites that are there. My people will destroy them and put them under our feet. And we will give the glory to Jehovah. Amen. Thank you guys for letting me dress up today. <laughs> and maybe challenge some of you with what uh, Caleb did so long ago. This was going to put my shirt on for the sake of the camera. Thank you. And I know I have a dress on, but you know the three quarters of the men in the world wear dresses. So I'm in style and you are not. <laughs> Caleb started strong and finished well. That was the assignment that was given to me by Jamie a couple months ago. And boy, I, I, I bit at the chance when he asked. I already began to have begun to study Caleb and what a wonderful study. And so for a few moments today, we're going to be in the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 14. It says, Now the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephna the Kenanite, Kenzanite said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back and report according to my convictions. Underline that, look at that phrase in this passage because of Caleb's convictions my brothers who went up with me the other spies made the hearts of the people melt with fear I however followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly another key phrase here his convictions and following the Lord wholeheartedly that's how we're going to leave a legacy gentlemen that's how we need to start strong and finish well. Now Joshua, or Caleb, says, I am today 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the Lord, the day that Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out into battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord has promised. You yourself heard that the Anakites were there, and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me. I will drive them out just as he said. And then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephthah, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. 
So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephthah, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. There that word is used again. And then the land had rest for war. You've got some handout sheets. You're welcome to use those. Follow along. It's kind of my outline today. Very simple because I'm a very simple preacher. I truly believe that oftentimes we worry about our legacy and what we're going to leave behind. And if we would just start the right way in our lives. Some of you started at a, at a young age perhaps serving the Lord. Some of you came to know the Lord in maybe recent times. But whatever time start when we begin to give our hearts to the Lord, start strong and be a man of God. Caleb was a man of God. He brought back a report according to his convictions in verse 7. He was, he was sure that they could possess the land. To live the life and leave a legacy is going to take the conviction of your heart, gentlemen. Make no mistake about it. Again, verse 6 and 7, where it says that he brought back a report according to his convictions, not his opinion. We all have opinions. And my opinions are probably different than your opinions. And opinions are A-OK, -okay, but that's not what we need to be preaching. We've got several pastors here. Pastor Brian, you better not be preaching a real life church, just your opinions. <laughs> Pastor Fred, you better not be preaching just your opinions. We preach our convictions. Now, now Pastor Joe over there, he, he's got this thing down. I mean, he's when I grew up on it, he like Pastor Joe all in that day. He's a man of faith. He's a man of God's word. These other men are as well, okay? We have to be men in our churches, in our families. Those of us who are married, we've got to be men of convictions and, and, and make a stand. We've got to live now according to what we know God's Word says. And not be swayed by what might be coming down the line as far as culture or society is concerned. I think that's where some of us men are losing. Losing things in our lives. Caleb saw giants in the land. They saw the walled city, huge walls that somebody had built. Huge walls. All the spies saw that. Would you agree? Yes. All the spies saw the land that was flowing with milk and honey. Would you agree to that? But ten of them felt that they could not because of the size overcome. All of them saw the same thing. They, they didn't see different things. But the difference, I really believe this, guys, was that he brought back a report according to his convictions that if God be for us, who can be against us? We walk by faith and not by sight. We're all in our local churches. I encourage you to get behind your pastor. Get behind your leadership. Some of you are, are in leadership positions in your church. How many are in leadership right now in your church? Some form, board, what have you? Yes, yes, many of you. And you are responsible for standing upon God's word and presenting to that congregation the conviction of your heart based upon God's word. It, it's, it, it's absolutely essential to us. We have younger generations that need to see that. Now imagine just two guys out of a million and a half, maybe two million, they said. Only two men in that generation got to go in to see the promised land. And then the next generation did, all because of the rebellion in people's hearts and lives. Do you see the seriousness of what we are in here today? And I don't want to go contrary to what our conference is doing today about a legacy and leaving a legacy, but I truly believe that if we live our lives every single day taking steps toward the cross, making sure that Christ is in our lives, living according to our convictions, our legacy is going to take care of itself. Can you say amen? amen? Let me show you something else. I think Caleb had the guts to stand alone. When everybody was saying, let's go back to Egypt, and they, they, they said that, the generation, the 
Joshua was part of this. They said, let's go back to Egypt. Let's forget it. We can't do it. It's impossible. But it was Caleb that said, no, we're going to go in. Caleb that ripped his clothes and begged them. Listen, man, we have to have guts to stand alone. Pastors, you need to have guts to stand alone and stand upon principle. Board members, you need to have guts. What do they say? Intestinal fortitude, right? The world has other terminology, but we won't use that here today. We've got to have the cojones, guys. That we know, that we know, that we know. Amen? Amen. And we will be pressed. We will be pressed. I had the last couple of weeks been dealing with some situations, not from our church, but with our sectional uh, church in our section, and just some animosity and bitterness that was rising in some people's lives, and I had to lovingly say some strong words to to a couple. And uh, Pastor Steve Torvo even called me this past week and said, "Well, what did you say?" And I said. This is what I said. And then he chuckled and he says, well, I'm glad you said it because he was going to talk with them and have the same, have the same conversation. He said, he says, well, we're on the same page. But we stand upon our convictions. Listen, get behind your pastor. Get behind the leadership of your church. We will make mistakes, and we, but hopefully we're seeking the hand of God and hopefully we're trying to take our congregations to, to that land of promise. Hopefully we're trying to take our families there. If ever before, you want to leave a legacy, you want to leave a name for yourself, be a man of God, stand on your conviction, have the guts to stand alone, no matter what the pressures may bring your way. We've got to be those kind of men. When you look at Caleb's life, you see that it begins when they were at Kadesh Barnea. And verse 12 says, Give me this hill country that the Lord's promised me that day. Two extremes in Caleb's life. And then the whole narrative boils down to what the Lord says to him in verse 10. Just as the Lord had promised is granted to Caleb. Because Caleb was a man who said, I'm going to live every single day under the hand of the authority of God, under the hand of the authority of my leadership, Moses, Aaron, eventually Joshua. Our Christian faith, gentlemen, is based upon God's promise. It's based upon the Word of God. The foundation and anchor of Caleb's faith was just that. He was able to live for the cause of the Lord and of Jehovah. He was able to live for the glory and live by faith. Reminded of all the men in the Bible that had to wait for a period of time. You think about Caleb, faithful even though he went back, even though the whole majority was against he and Joshua. He didn't bail shit. He still held on to the promise. Eighty-five years old, going in and saying, "I'm going to be part of this promise land." Eighty-five years old, he's going to take the hardest part of Canaan. And he says, I'm going to do that because it's for my descendants and those that follow after me. What determination. We've got a guy at our church and he's here in this room today. He's 85 years old and Sid Woodcock down there. Sid has that kind of determination and conviction. Wave your hand there, Sid. Put Sid with her on the end right there. When I think of Caleb, I think of Sid. Sid's dad lived to be, what, 105? Part of the Lewistown Assembly of Church. 104? And uh, I think Sid's going to outlive me unless the Lord returns. We're praying for that. And he's a man of faith. Just was returned to our church board last Sunday at our annual business meeting. We had some young men that were up for selection, but he received favorable results. And afterwards, uh, and I thought everybody that was up in our church for, for business, I, I could have served as any one of the six or eight that were up for, for selection. We selected three. But I was reminiscing this earlier this week, and the Lord reminded me, Sid is leaving a legacy because of his life all every single day, living for the Lord, 
trust in God, man of faith. Noah spent 120 years building the ark before he saw the promise of God. 120 years, friend. Abraham waited for his son Isaac 25 years after the promise. Sometimes I can't handle a couple months, let alone a couple weeks. We look and we see that Caleb's waiting for at least 40 plus years. Some commentaries believe maybe 45. It was 40 in the wilderness and then several years as they came into the land and took Jericho and Ai and some of the other installations and the fortified cities before he ever was able to go and conquer Hebron for himself. So perhaps 45 years before he recognized his inheritance. Wow. Pastor John, I don't know if I can wait that. Oh, no. Pastor John pastors our church on 11th Street, Hope Community Church, doing a tremendous job there. You want to talk about a man of faith right here as a pastor, as a man of faith. He's believing God for so many things and, and, and soon to open up the men's shelter there. He's got a heart for the city of Altoona. Pray for him. Pray for his church, his ministry. He's, he's falling right here in this Caleb spirit. Can, 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 can I divert for a moment or two here? You know, pastors do that. We go down the rabbit trail. Pray for us. And I was told we've got to be done by 11 o'clock, so we're doing good on time. And you know what? We always talk about the Jezebel spirit, and I know about the Jezebel spirit. We've got the books on that. We've got, you know, this spirit, that. Why don't we have someone writing about the Caleb spirit? You know, something positive. Think on these things, Paul says. The Caleb spirit. Right? The Elijah spirit. Let's have some of that in our churches and say, this is what we need to be following after. Just put that out in case some of you want to write a book, okay? Yeah. All right? Just let, you know, the proceeds and the royalties that, you know, I gave you. Now. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Forty years, Forty years wandering in the deserts. Probably five, six, seven years of battle. Here he is, 85 years of age. The very giants that turned the Israelites away from God are the giants that Caleb's going to fight. And there's giants in your home, and there's giants in your family, there's giants in our individual life. But if we stand firm on our conviction, we met God, stand on his promises, we can turn those giants around. We don't have to run from them. You heard that from a guy dressed in a dress today, okay? <laughs> Billy Graham, what a man of God. When he contracted Parkinson's here, what, 15, 20 years ago, I think it was, somewhere in that neighborhood, don't quote me on that, but when he contracted Parkinson's, there was uh, different, you know, ABC News and some of the media outlets that interviewed him. And they, the one uh, reporter said, now, Reverend Graham, what are you going to do now that you've and Parkinson's and now that you're going to be in retirement now what are you going to do and this is his quote he says excuse me and with all due respect I'm called to preach the word I have no plan to retire if it's time God will retire me Amen. and as far as I know Billy Graham has never said he's retired he's like 90 some I know he's failing in his health Frank and Graham has stepped up. But what a legacy. Billy Graham. And listen, guys, I hope you're like me. I'm praying for the next Billy Graham in our nation. We need it now as we're seeing everything around us. We need a Billy Graham to come on the scene that will preach the truth. Billy Graham has this Caleb spirit. Caleb's object of faith was God and not himself. And we need faith in God. Again, out of two billion people, only two went into the promised land. That's Joshua and Caleb. So, I asked some people the last couple of weeks, why only two? What's so special? Was it their faith? I think faith was a contributor. Was there some special qualification that they had? I, I, I'm not sure about that. I truly believe it was God's grace on their life and favor on their life. What it means is if there's only one Joshua or Caleb out of a million people, God will use that one or two individual out of a million people. 
That's the kind of life I want to live. I hope it's the kind of life that you want to live. And again, if we live this, our lives will fall into line. And my prayer today is that we'll have that kind of faith and that kind of life to live for His cause, to live for His glory, and to live by faith. It's not us, pastors. It's not us. It's not our name on the marquee. It's Jesus Christ. Board members, it's not about us. It's not about getting on the church board and having power to control people. If that's your idea, you need to get off that board right now. I have served the last couple of years, number of years, with, with men and some women on our church board in our church that have a heart after God. They want to see something happen in our city, in our area of our city. And I'm so honored just to work alongside work with fellow workers who we are. To live for His glory and to live by faith. The Bible says, My servant followed me wholeheartedly. I've got one more thing I just want to share, guys. We're doing really good all the time. <coughs> Our church wishes I would preach this short every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> one last thing I've saved, I think, maybe the Okay, my opinion, not conviction, my opinion, maybe the best for last. Caleb was a hero behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, I think it's on your paper. Joshua got all the attention for 40 years. Think about it. For 40 years, Joshua gets all the attention. He's the leader. He gets the attention when they come into the land of promise. He's the leader. Takes them over the Jordan River. Remember, they go across the Red Sea, the sea is parted, but at the Jordan River, the scripture says that the waters were stopped as they ran southward, and they backed up to the north. And you can only imagine, and it was at flood time, and so you can only imagine how the waters were building and building up from that point across from Jericho northward, and the people come again across on dry ground and put up the memorial stone. And so, here we have Joshua leading them in. Hearing from the Lord the march of the times around Jericho. And Caleb is just in a supportive role. In fact, you don't read anymore about Caleb until you get here later on in the book of Joshua. You read about him when he came into the, the land, the spies in the land, but you don't read any more about him until here. He's the guy behind the scenes. Pastors, You have some men and women that are behind the scenes that don't get a lot of notoriety. People don't see them Sunday after Sunday on the pulpit, on the platform. But you have some men and women in your churches behind the scenes that you can't do without. And they've got kingdom spirits. I'm honored today to have a couple guys in this room that I'm really really know who they got my back. There's nothing better for a pastor when you hear a board member say, Pastor, we got your back. Last spring, the neurologist told my wife and I, my wife had such, such horrible diseases and situations and her health has just been so, so very poor. And I went to our church board and just simply I asked for a three-month sabbatical. Just kind of threw it out there. I was hoping to get a month and a half. I don't know if they know that, but I was hoping for a month and a half. And there's some men in this room right now that said, Pastor, you take three months. We'll take care of things. You can't imagine what that did for this guy. They believed in me. Pastors, when you get somebody like that in your church, report on and you, pray, you pray for them every single day. They've got that behind the scenes. Thank God. I, I want to be there for my pastor, Steve Torval. I want to be that for, for the authority that is over me. I want to be the guy behind the scenes, whatever you need. And I said that to my pastor the other day when he called. I said, because he's going through some things. And I said, Pastor Steve, I want to pray for you. Pastor Steve, if there's something I can do, I'll, I'll try to help. Because he's going through a real situation right now. I want to have that kingdom spirit. I'm preaching this to me, guys. <laughs> It doesn't matter if I have a big church. It doesn't matter if I have a small. It doesn't matter.
matter if I write a book or don't write, I know that when all is said and done, I hope that my children will say, our father was a man of God. I hope my wife can say, our, my husband led this family with the things of God. And I hope and pray that the churches I've pastored can say, he was a man of God. Well done, done, good and faithful. That's all I want to hear God say. I hope that's your desire today as well. How many Joshua's can you have in a church? <laughs> One. How many Joshua's can you have? One. That's all Israel had was one Joshua. But you can have hundreds of Caleb's. Willing to be behind the scene. All Caleb wanted was that mountain. Pastor Fred, give me that mountain. God says of Caleb, in the book of Joshua chapter 14, my servant Caleb has followed me wholeheartedly. God said that about him. Excuse me, that's in the book of Numbers 14. Joshua 14, verse 9, Moses says, You, Caleb, have wholeheartedly followed the Lord. The Bible says, Because Caleb wholeheartedly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. And then Caleb himself, speaking about his life, Joshua 14, verse 8, he says, I wholeheartedly follow the Lord my God. Live the life, the legacy will last. I'll ask you the question this morning, and I don't expect an answer. I'm not sure any of us really know. In fact, the other day as I was putting finishing touches on this lesson, I had to go and research it. Name the other ten spots. Name, name five. Okay, I'm going to be real easy on you. Travis, name one of them. One One of the ten spies that didn't bring back a good report. He's our sectional ranger commander. He should know this. Well, Travis, join the group because I couldn't get your name. You don't. Pastor Brian, right. you're, you're smart. You're yeah. Yeah. No. But we can name the two guys. Yeah. Joshua and Caleb. Why? Because of the spirit they have. They wholeheartedly. Listen, gentlemen. They're going to know us by our fruits. I can battle for another minute or two. If you're a cantankerous, complaining God in your marriage. Your family's not going to appreciate or love that. If you're cantankerous and always find a fault in the church, and pastor, why don't you do this? And board members, why don't you do this? And da, 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 da. You are not going to be remembered. Oh, who was that pastor we had? But they'll remember when you were there at their side when their loved ones are dying. They will remember when you pray for them at an altar to receive the Holy Spirit. They'll remember when you just encourage them in the hallways of the church. And they'll remember you as a faithful man. A godly man. A man that started strong and finishing well. See, I, I passed the 60 mark a couple years ago, well, like two years ago. You know, and somebody tells me it's downhill from here. At least that's what Sid told me. It's downhill from here. You know, all I know is maybe I have another 10 years pastoring at a church. I, I don't, they, they may not want me after five years. Or I'm only as good as my last sermon, so they may not want me next week. All I know is I'm going to give my effort every single day of my life, every single week. I'm going to finish well. I don't want to just slide and go to retirement. I might not be your cup of tea. That's fine. All right? But I'm going to be what God's called me to be. I want you to be what God's called you to be. Caleb didn't put on his slippers. He put on his hiking boots. Caleb claimed the mountain. As a young man, he stood alone in the wilderness. He walked alone. And as an old man, guess what? He climbed alone to the heights. Take that to the bank. Caleb was a man of altitudes, not a man of attitude. And 
that's Smith's version, okay? <laughs> Wasn't content with the average, just getting by. He didn't think in terms of fences. He didn't think in terms of walled cities. He didn't think in terms of, we can't do this. He said in terms, let's go possess the land. For your church, your family, let's have that spirit. I'm not saying God's calling you to have a mega church. But why don't you have the best church, the church, an excellent church? Are we praying for souls? Are we praying for lives? Boys and girls, teens, moms and dads, grandparents? Let's be the best we can. Father God, I pray for these men today. Lord, they've come to this conference because each one of us want to live a life that's pleasing to you. And we pray, God, that we will leave a legacy a life that people would look at our gravestone and they would say, there is a man of God, a faithful man. Maybe not a man of monetary wealth and value. Maybe not a man that was eloquent in speech, but a man that was excellent in character, that he trusted you. Make us those men today. Thank you, Ben.